Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Former President Trump is heading back to Florida. He pleaded not guilty in his unprecedented arraignment. DA Alvin Bragg accuses the former president of covering up crimes. What will the DA do next and how might Trump's defense team respond? A man indicted by the Justice Department for election interference is convicted over satirical memes he made in the lead up to the 2016 election. We have the breakdown and analysis. A senior ISIS leader who was responsible for planning terrorist attacks is killed in Syria. No civilians are killed or injured in the strike. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy set to meet Taiwan's leader tomorrow in a highly sensitive move that's got China's communist regime issuing threats. Taiwan saying it will neither yield nor provoke. And Russia threatens countermeasures as Finland becomes the 31st member of NATO. From Trump Tower. Former President Trump left early this afternoon riding in a black SUV with Secret Service agents just minutes before discreetly entering the tightly guarded Manhattan courthouse where he surrendered himself for fraud-related charges. The indictment against him was then unsealed describing the crimes he's accused of. The former president pleaded not guilty. What happens next? NTD's Arlene Richards has the latest developments. Former President Trump traveled to the Manhattan Criminal Court today for an unprecedented and history-making appearance before a New York state judge, the first former president to face criminal charges. He posted on social media from a black SUV on his way to the courthouse. Seems so surreal. Wow, they are going to arrest me. Can't believe this is happening in America. The NYPD and the Secret Service kept the former president's visibility low. Trump giving a quick wave before entering the courthouse. The former president was processed and fingerprinted before appearing before Judge Juan Merchant. The unsealed indictment revealed 34 felony charges of falsifying business records in the first degree. The charges date back to several checks allegedly signed by Trump in 2017 and paid to his former attorney Michael Cohen as reimbursement for a hush money payment of $130,000 that Cohen paid to adult film actress Stormy Daniels. These payments were allegedly labeled as legal expenses. The indictment claims that was done with the intent of covering up another crime. The other crime is allegedly suppressing information ahead of an election. Trump has pleaded not guilty. Tonight, Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg gave a statement after Trump's arraignment. The defendant repeatedly made false statements on New York business records. He also caused others to make false statements. Bragg said the evidence will show that Trump did so to cover up crimes relating to the 2016 election. People from both sides weighed in. We feel like this is uh, unequal justice under the law. I think it's well appropriate and he's not above the law. He's not the only president that has something against him. Other presidents in line have had done things. It should come out and he should be uh, held accountable like any other person. Attorneys differed on the consequences of the charges. Once he decides what he's going to do, then he will officially be part of the criminal process. He's going to be a defendant in a case. And that, in that instance, that is going to distinguish this former president from any other former president. This is about the entire scope of what we understand as the rule of law and the constitutionally protected civil liberties in our country. But President Biden is remaining mum. I have no comment on that. At a rally outside the courthouse, GOP Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene called it election interference. Trump is expected to return to Mar-a-Lago tonight where he will hold his own press conference. In the days ahead, the prosecution will turn over all evidence to Trump's defense team. Trump's attorneys are expected to file motions to dismiss the case for different reasons, including that the statute of limitations has expired and that Trump was already prosecuted by the previous district attorney. Arlene Richards, NTD News. A man who posted memes about the 2016 election has been found guilty of election interference and conspiring against the right to vote. 33-year-old Douglas Mackey is now facing up to 10 years in prison. 
The conviction has some observers sounding the alarm over what could be the broader implications of this conviction. I recently spoke with a journalist who's been following and covering this story extensively. The founder and editor of Revolver News, Darren Beatty, breaks it down for us. Darren Beatty, welcome to our show. Thanks for coming on again. Fantastic to be back. Thank you. Great to have you. Now, Douglas Mackey's case, it hasn't been getting much attention, but some credit him with helping Trump to get elected in 2016. So to start with, for our viewers who may not be familiar with this case, could you tell us who he is and how he came to be convicted of election interference? Absolutely. So Douglas Mackey is the real life face behind a compelling internet persona known as Ricky Vaughn. MIT did some kind of ranking of the most influential media accounts in the 2016 election. And Ricky Vaughn's account actually bested a lot of uh, very, very well-resourced mainstream institutions, including, I think, NBC. So it's punching well above his weight. And part of the reason for that was the effective use of memes. In fact, one of the most kind of exciting and interesting aspects of the 2016 election is how the kind of the meme culture of the internet was uh, opened up and became this formidable political force in its own right. And Ricky Vaughn character was very much a part of that. And the problem with being incredibly effective is you irritate very powerful people. Fast forward to a little over two years ago, uh, Doug Mackey was apprehended by the FBI. Weird. For what? What did he do? They said, you're facing felony charges for memes that you promoted mocking Hillary Clinton. What? No joke. This is for real. And indeed, it was real. The federal government prosecuted Doug Mackey for memes mocking Hillary Clinton, claiming that he violated something called the Ku Klux Klan Act. Now, this act goes way back into the nation's history, and its original design was intended to prevent organizations like the Ku Klux Klan from physically intimidating African Americans from going to polling stations and voting. Nothing objectionable about that. But the Department of Justice created this incredibly complex, innovative interpretation of the statute, whereby the it, uh, memes that are supposed disinformation memes became a violations in relation to this law, that you're tricking people uh, and that's the same thing as physically intimidating people from the polls. And so to get the sense of what's going on, it's important to say what the context of the actual memes were. One of the memes, the meme in question here, basically said, you can avoid the line, just text this number to vote for Hillary. And it was a well-established satirical meme format uh, that's basically meant to say Hillary voters are so stupid that they'll text a number rather than go to the polls. Uh, again, well-established meme format. The left had used the same meme format without any prosecution. The government was unable to produce a single aggrieved party. That is to say, they were unable to produce a single person who claims, say, look, I was going to vote, but I texted because I saw this meme and therefore I didn't vote. Not a single person that the government said this person was deprived of his or her right to vote on the basis of being deceived by these memes. The whole thing is ridiculous, clearly satirical, clearly an innovation in the application of this law, and clearly an attempt for the Biden administration, apart from punishing this very specific and very effective political enemy, more broadly, to begin the very dangerous process of codifying the disinformation scam into criminal law, such that in the first stage, they use this term disinformation just to wipe you off of social media. That's the first stage of deplatforming. The second stage, once it's been codified into criminal law through this precedent, it's never been used before in this fashion, through this precedent, and they obtained a guilty conviction, so it is a precedent now, 
until it's overturned on appeal, to reach the second stage of deplatforming, which is not blast you off of social media, it's put you behind bars. I'll leave it for an exercise to the audience to figure out what step comes after prison. And so this is why I've said the Doug Mackey case, and he was convicted, by the way, and faces 10 years in prison if it's not overturned in appeal, which is insane. This case is just as important to the First Amendment as the Kyle Rittenhouse case was to the Second Amendment. It is indeed the most important First Amendment case in this country in a very long time. So what do you think that people can do if they're concerned about this issue and they want to help out somehow? You can familiarize yourself with the details of the case, and you can do that at revolver.news. We've written about this case extensively, and you can support the Legal Defense Fund for Doug Mackey at memedefensefund.com. All right. Darren Beatty, founder and editor of Revolver News, thank you so much. Thank you very much. The United States military has killed a senior ISIS leader in Syria. They say his death will disrupt the terrorist group's ability to plan more attacks. NTD's Jason Perry has the details of the strike. On Monday, the United States Central Command Forces, or CENTCOM, conducted a unilateral strike in Syria, killing a senior ISIS leader. The terrorist's name was Khalid Ayyad Ahmed al Jabouri, and no civilians were killed or injured in the strike. al Jabouri was responsible for planning terrorist attacks in Turkey and Europe. He also developed the leadership structure for ISIS in Turkey. CENTCOM says his death will now hinder the terrorist group's ability to plan other attacks. But CENTCOM Commander General Michael Carrilla said, though degraded, the group remains able to conduct operations within the region with a desire to strike beyond the Middle East. ISIS, a Sunni terrorist group, once controlled one-third of Iraq and Syria at its peak in 2014. And although much of ISIS has been defeated, a United Nations report estimates there are between 2,500 to 3,500 ISIS fighters between Iraq and Syria. And CENTCOM says it remains committed to the enduring defeat of ISIS. Jason Perry, NTD News. And looking ahead, eyes are watching as a sensitive meeting is set to take place tomorrow between House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and Taiwan's president. Tsai Ing-wen's U.S. stopover is drawing the ire of the Chinese regime, which claims the democratically ruled island as its own. Beijing has repeatedly warned U.S. officials not to meet Tsai. And the White House has urged China not to use her stopover in the U.S. as a pretext to increase aggressive activity against Taiwan. The regime fired missiles near Taiwan last year after Nancy Pelosi traveled there and it sanctioned the then House Speaker and her family. Taiwan's de facto embassy in Washington said of tomorrow's meeting, During transits through the U.S., the president engages with American friends in line with past precedents. McCarthy previously said that he hoped to visit Taiwan. And on the economy, the financial world today analyzing the annual letter from J.P. Morgan CEO. He made predictions about the current banking crisis and surprising warnings about China. J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon sent his annual letter to shareholders on Tuesday, saying the banking crisis is not over yet. In this 43-page message, he said, the current crisis is not yet over, and even when it is behind us, there will be repercussions from it for years to come. The banking system currently is under renewed stress after the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse's rescue by UBS last month. The letter reads, the stock market is down and the market's odds of a recession have increased. And while this is nothing like 2008, it is not clear when this current crisis will end. According to the CEO, the risks that led to the current crisis were hiding in plain sight. For example, interest rate exposure and the level of uninsured deposits at Silicon Valley Bank. Diamond also made blunt statements about the strategic risks China poses, saying China, using subsidies and its economic muscle to dominate batteries, rare earths, semiconductors or EVs, could eventually imperil national security by disrupting our access to these products and materials. We cannot cede these important resources and capabilities to another country. It's not common for a global business leader to make such direct statements. Reporting by Arian Pastar, 
NTD News. And in health news, if you're using Esricare or Delsam Pharma eye drops, watch out. The FDA says the product's Indian factory couldn't ensure its products are sterile after a number of deaths and injuries were linked to the drops. In a new report, Food and Drug Administration officials uncovered about a dozen problems with the, how the manufacturer, Go, Global Pharma Healthcare, made and tested its eye drops. That was during an inspection from late February through early March, in which officials found a dirty environment and only manual visual inspection to ensure bottles were sealed. The drops are linked to 68 bacterial infections in the U.S., including three deaths and eight cases of vision loss. Four people have had their eyeballs surgically removed due to infection. The drops were recalled in February. And in Europe, Finland today officially became the 31st member of the NATO Security Alliance, a historic policy shift brought on by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Moscow threatened countermeasures. Finland has formally joined NATO. Thank you very much. Well, with receipt uh, of this uh, instrument of accession, uh, we can now declare that Finland is the 31st member of the North Atlantic Treaty. The Finnish flag on Tuesday rose alongside 30 other flags at NATO headquarters in Brussels. The president of Finland called it a great day for Finland and an important day for NATO too. Security and uh, stability are those elements which we feel very strongly. And, uh, well, we can all think that if uh, people can live in secured, stable circumstances, that's the basic element of uh, happy life. Uh. Russia and Finland share an 800-mile border, roughly doubling the length of the border that NATO shares with Russia. People in the Russian city of St. Petersburg, which is less than 100 miles from the Finnish border, reacted to the news. I don't think anything will change for us. It will only get worse for the Finns because we don't go there and they will incur only losses from this, by and large, as we have nothing to share with them. They have their lives, we have ours. In response to Finland's accession, the Kremlin's spokesperson said Russia would be forced to take countermeasures. The enlargement of NATO is a threat to Russia's security and its national interests. Russia's defense minister said Finland's accession and the military alliance's move to increase its own combat readiness increased the risk of conflict. Of course, all this creates risks of a significant escalation of the conflict, but it will not affect the outcome of the special military operation. Finland and Sweden applied together to join NATO following Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. But objections from NATO members Turkey and Hungary have delayed the process. As its first act as a NATO member, Finland provided its ratification of Sweden's membership. And if you have any news tips or feedback for our show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. Coming up, ethnic studies and public education. Locals in one California district say they support the stated goals of the class, but some are concerned that the lessons don't reflect them. And Shen Yun Performing Arts is now touring the New York metropolitan area. Hear what audience members had to say after a performance in New Brunswick. Stay tuned for more after this short break. California school district is struggling to move its ethnic studies program forward. Not everyone in the community agrees with the program. NTD's David Lamb hears from those for and against it. The implementation of ethnic studies in school classrooms draws debate, as the case in a Monday meeting for the Mountain View Los Altos School District in Northern California. I received from various people in this district that this curriculum would be focused on legislative intent. I am upset to see that instead it focuses on radical and violent ideology rather than highlighting the many contributions and social advancements made by minority communities in California and throughout the U.S. 
Oppression is a part of our history. We can't erase it. We can't pretend it doesn't exist. We can focus on the contributions of all the people that make our country great. According to the district, ethnic studies is the interdisciplinary study of race and ethnicity, with an emphasis on the experiences and contributions of people of color in the United States. And with the approval of Assembly Bill 101 in 2021, one semester of ethnic studies becomes a requirement for high school graduation for the class of 2030. Some appreciate the opportunities to learn and discuss different histories and ethnic identities. And I thought that this course allowed me to see myself and it wasn't something that was available for myself or for my siblings, which is what I spoke about. And the amount of different things that I went through in school, this would be hugely impactful in helping to combat that. And I'm really excited for, for the students who are going to continue to take the course. Others say the curriculum leans toward a negative lens of different groups of people. For them to understand the world is not that simplistic. It doesn't have just two class. The ones has the power and the ones who are victim. And they use this exactly a political jargon in China had a cultural revolution to have kids, young generation kids overthrown the government, overthrown the authorities. Currently, there are only five teachers teaching ethnic studies at this school district, and one teacher expects that number to triple in the near future. More meetings are tentatively scheduled for April. Reporting in Mountain View, California, David Lamb, NTD News. A failed space launch, and now the company is filing for bankruptcy. Virgin Orbit already laid off the majority of its employees last month amid a lack of funding. Virgin Orbit filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on Tuesday after it failed to secure the long-term funding needed to help it recover from a January rocket failure. The Long Beach-based company lodged the filing in the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the District of Delaware. It's seeking to sell off its assets after announcing a layoff of roughly 85 percent of its 750 employees last week. In a statement, the company's CEO said, At this stage, we believe that the Chapter 11 process represents the best path forward to identify and finalize an efficient and value-maximizing sale. The company listed assets of about $240 million and its total debt at about $153.5 million as of September 30th in the filing. Virgin Orbit went public in 2021 through a blank check deal, raising $255 million less than expected. The company's sixth mission in January, the first rocket launch out of Britain, failed to reach orbit and sent its payload of U.S. and U.K. intelligence satellites plunging into the ocean. Shenyun Performing Arts stopped in New Brunswick over this, the weekend. It's the company's first performance of the season in New York metropolitan area. Theatergoers said they appreciated the beauty of the performance and the culture it presents. Let's take a look. Shin Yoon starts its tour in the tri-state area with four performances in New Brunswick, New Jersey from March 30th to April 1st. I love the show. It's absolutely beautiful. I've never seen anything like it. It's unbelievable. I mean, the colors are beautiful. It's uplifting and then I'm crying. I mean, it's just a really beautiful, beautiful show. Beautiful. This is absolutely amazing. It's gorgeous. Uh, the tradition, the, uh, the dancing, the costumes, unbelievable. The state of New Jersey presented a joint legislation resolution recognizing Shin Yun Performing Arts. The city's mayor also honored the group with an award. What's more, theater goers shared their appreciation of Shin Yun's mission to bring back traditional Chinese culture from before communism. I think it's a very valuable mission that has to be completed. Um, I think it's important that um, everyone knows that no government has the right to destroy anyone's culture. They pointed out that the values shown in the performance are spiritual and universal. I thought there was a tremendous amount of energy and I think that it sort of, you know, relates to all religions and all cultures and all feelings of divinity. It's important to, to follow your faith. You have to understand that we all have a creator and that evolution and atheism really isn't the truth. Beyond the artists, audience members commended Shen Yun's production crew. Many added they would recommend the performance to others. 
So I can't wait to let everyone know what we think. I would recommend it to everyone. It's a beautiful show. It really is. I would absolutely recommend this show. I go to Broadway often, and this is unlike anything we typically see, so it's a wonderful thing to come and see. Starting this Thursday, Shen Yun will take to the stage at New York City's Lincoln Center for 13 performances through April 16th. NTD News, New Brunswick, New Jersey. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Good night.